thank you very much, John. I appreciate you guys um, being here with us to help us for this particular session as well. You're welcome. Welcome to week two of our course on refugee and migrant health. And as part of our weekly course activities, we have a seminar presentation. From week one, our seminar focused on the experiences of a migrant and the perspective of the origin, the travel and destination aspects of a refugee's life. This week, we would like to build upon the experience of a migrant and focus on how migrants and refugees themselves are actually managed, coordinated, in particular at these refugee camps themselves. We appreciate as well from last week, the number of refugees around the world are increasing and we can all recognize from the news, from the, the topical issues that refugee crises are emerging, re-emerging around the world. Today, we have the opportunity and, and great fortune to join us for our week two seminar, Pierre Yves Malhon, currently located in Turkey and has direct experience working with several of our international agencies, United Nations, WHO, and many other organizations in terms of working with these refugee groups. Pierre will share the perspective from his experiences, in particular with refugees in Syria, which is one of our largest refugee experiences currently, and also in, in countries in Africa as well. So Pierre, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And please introduce yourself to our, our course community. And of course, we look forward to sharing in your experiences as we explore the issue of refugee and migrant health. Thank you, Satesh, for the introduction. Um, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, so my name is Pierre Margon. Uh, I've worked for over 12 years uh, for humanitarian and development uh, institutions um, across Colombia, Sudan, Chad, Yemen, um, Burma, Haiti, uh, Lebanon. And uh, I'm currently working now in, in Turkey for a, a research uh, center. So we are focused on, on Syria, Iraq, um, Libya, and Mali. Um, so I'm going to brief you a bit about like the, the current context in Syria because I'm actually working a lot with uh, the World Health Organization and give you a, a quick, uh, uh, quick uh, briefing about the, the current health situation in Syria and the challenges faced by, by uh, humanitarian stakeholders. Then um, on the second part of my presentation, I will, I will talk more about my own experience in a, as an implementer with a, a other NGOs in, in Lebanon, for instance, dealing with them. Um, prior to the current, uh, now eight-year uh, long humanitarian crisis, Syria was a, a low to middle-income country of about like 20, 21 million population uh, with a very strong health infrastructure. So the conflict has now greatly affected the, the civilian infrastructure, including health infrastructure, obviously. Um, and it has also led to a, a, a massive internal displacement of populations. The number of Syrians currently living within Syria is estimated at between 15 to 16 million, with about half of them living in the governorates of, uh, of Araka, Idlib, Hama, al uh, and Aleppo. Uh, according to WHO, there were 12.8 million people in need of medical assistance by the end of 2017, a figure which, which was up by 1.6 million compared to the end of 2016. So the current context contributes to difficulties in delivery of, of humanitarian assistance and increases the vulnerability of, of persons in need, especially women and children. Um, now I'd like to, to, to shed the light on the health situation in Syria and coming back a bit to the, uh, before the conflict. Prior to 2011, Syria had one of the strongest and most developed health systems in the region. Um, Syria's decentralized health system was nationalized and heavily focused on primary and preventive care, although provision of secondary health services uh, was also strong. So Syrians were able to access health services, including medicines, for free at government-supported facilities. The country also had a well-expanded private health sector. Before the crisis and over a period of nearly uh, 30 years, 
key health indicators had improved and were commensurate to those in middle income countries. In 2009, just for you to, to, to get the full picture, life, life expectancy at birth was 73 years old. Infant mortality was 17.9 per 1,000 live births. Under five, um, mortality was 21.4 uh, per, per 1,000 live births. And maternal uh, mortality, 52 per 100,000 live births. However, despite um, the existence of a centralized health systems, significant information gaps regarding the health situation and service provision existed in Syria before the onset of the conflict. The now eight year um, long humanitarian crisis has um, negatively affected both the health system and population level health outcomes nationwide. So negative impacts to the system include destruction of health facilities, severe health worker shortages, a drastic reduction in the production of medicines, and an overall increase in medicine prices. As of September 2018, 452 health facilities had been attacked and 886 health workers killed. Countrywide, um, an estimated 57% of health facilities and 51% of public health centers are either only partially functional or closed. Um, about half of all medical facilities have been partially damaged and about 16 of them destroyed. Um, life expectancy is estimated most recently to be 59 years for males and 69 for females, according to the last uh, report from the World Health Organization. And the median age is estimated to be 24.5 years. So infant and under five mortality are estimated at 14 and 17 per 1,000 live births, respectively. So you can see like the, the, the sharp evolution of, uh, of the figures. The maternal mortality is estimated at, at 68 per 100,000 live births. However, countrywide population-based surveys have not um, been conducted since before the crisis started, and current estimates are not reliable. Um, there are myriad negative health service impacts of the crisis. There are reports of doctors postponing elective surgeries, requests of, of premature discharge from care, and requests for C-section instead of uh, vaginal delivery. Approximately 46% of pregnant women plan a C-section today in Syria, compared to 19% pre-crisis. Uh, furthermore, there has been a re-emergence of vaccine preventable disease, such as polio, cholera, and measles. Food vaccine coverage among children under five has dropped from 90% prior to the conflict to an estimated 50 to 70% currently, according to, to WHO and, and the World Bank. Finally, um, approximately 40% of the estimated 500,000 deaths resulting from the crisis are attributable to a lack of access to appropriate and timely health care. Um, now talking more about focusing more on the humanitarian response to, to the health crisis in Syria. Um, back in 2014, the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution, uh, 2139, uh, mandating UN agencies to organize a, human, a humanitarian response for the whole of Syria. So I will explain to you how, how that response uh, is being implemented. So from Turkey, uh, you have part of the response to support people residing in Northwest Syria, okay? From Iraq, you have part of the response to support people in West and Northeast Syria, and from Jordan to reach people in Southern Syria. Um, the health response is coordinated by the World Health Organization from a central office in Damascus and four sub-offices in Homs, Aleppo, Latakia, and Alasakia. Further, in 2013, um, WHO established a hub in Gaziantep to lead the health response from Turkey to people living in northern Syria, where, like, this is where I'm actually working at the moment. So in 2014, WHO started cross-border operations from Turkey and 2015 from Jordan. So the UN established uh, that health cluster for northern Syria just to coordinate the efforts among the, the many implementing organizations operating to support the health system in northern Syria 
and in the absence of a recognized governmental authority. Um, so in 2015, um, the field office of uh, the World Health Organization, Gaziantep, began developing what they call an essential health service package, because most of, of the humanitarian partners agreed it was important to standardize the health services in, in northern Syria. To this end, they requested the support from the health cluster for northern Syria to coordinate the work and provide a space through which stakeholders could participate actively in the process of developing that essential health service package. So the public primary care health system uh, is organized into the following levels of healthcare, just for you to understand the, the humanitarian response. Level one, mobile primary health units. Level two, primary healthcare units. And level three, primary healthcare centers. The fourth level is the, the one of comprehensive primary healthcare centers. Um, higher level acute care and specialized chronic care is provided at secondary health facilities, which are often run by private and NGO sectors. Um, currently, this public system is being run by dozens of non-governmental organizations, at least in northern Syria, and in the area where the Gaziantep Health Cluster is operating. So, these organizations are both international and Syrian. Um, back in 2016, just to support the implementing partners in, in Syria, the World Health Organization established and rolled out uh, a supply line uh, of medicines that distributes free of charge medicine supplies and equipment to almost 200 health facilities. To this date, the supply line provided 20 million of US dollars worth of medicines, supplies and equipment. And the supply line covers an estimated 25 to 30 percent of the medicine needs in the areas and the responsibility of, uh, of um, the health cluster. So, yeah, that was a presentation of the, of the current context in Syria. Now, uh, talking about my own experience uh, dealing with refugees, in, in, uh, for instance, in, uh, in Lebanon, the major issue was related to mental health and psychosocial support. Um, because the war in Syria has resulted in, in the greatest refugee movement of all time. Uh, 12 million Syrians have been driven from their home regions. Many, many have witnessed massacres, executions, bomb attacks. They had to endure forced displacement, kidnappings, imprisonment, torture, and rapes. Uh, they have lost family members and friends. They are living in a state of uncertainty over their fate. And in refugee camps and emergency accommodation, we noticed through our work uh, in the field a disintegration of, of the social structures, precarious life circumstances, and the lack of prospects, which frequently, frequently give rise to um, new acts of violence, above all against women and children. Forced marriages, uh, child marriages, and forced prostitutions are, are, are widespread. In today's refugee situation, Different gender concepts and legal codes among the, the host communities and refugees clash with each other and again cause conflict. In addition, uh, internally displaced people in particular uh, suffer from, uh, from siege situations in Syria and attacks in hospitals and the consequent difficulties in accessing food and medical care. Poverty and unemployment are also key psychosocial stress factors. So these population groups are especially vulnerable apart from women and children. In, they include young people, elderly people, persons with physical disabilities and, uh, and mental illnesses. Uh, before the armed conflict began, uh, the Syrian society was characterized by a great social, socioeconomic, ethnic and religious diversity, which along with demographic factors such as uh, um, age and gender was reflected in the group of refugees. So these various characteristics shape the sense of belonging and loyalty within the refugee community. And they have implications for people's psychosocial needs and adaptation mechanism, as well as the manner in, ways that in, in which they will seek help. So the significance of religious and group affiliation, for instance, uh, has increased uh, as the power of the state has diminished. So the, la the large number of children who were, who were attending school in Syria before the outbreak of conflict cannot be fully integrated into the school system by the host communities, to the detriment of the children's and young, pe young people's sense of normality. 
it was a case in Lebanon, for instance, where the French, uh, French language is part of the curriculum, in national curriculum in, in Lebanon. So it was not the case in, in, in Syria. So uh, United Agencies like UNICEF had to um, develop a sort of accelerated learning programs to facilitate their integration uh, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the education system. Another challenge is also that many of, uh, of their parents are suffering from a lack of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, livelihood opportunities. Hence, the, the, the requested support from children to work, uh, to work in, the, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural lands uh, um, during specific time of the agricultural calendar. So the phenomenon of forced displacement uh, created uh, like serious impact on the, the, the mental health of, uh, of the kids. When we're, when we're implementing education programs, we often uh, face the issue of kids not being able to concentrate uh, doing drawings of, of, of bombings or, or, or um, and so it was highlighting like the, the, the need to combine education activities with a psychosocial support. So as to be able to, to, to mitigate uh, uh, the, the, the tensions at school and facilitate the, in the integration in the, in the, in the, in the classes. Um, I just want to highlight here that like the, the clinical studies and diagnosis of mental disorders are extremely difficult to conduct among, among refugees and, and uh, internally displaced persons, both ethically and uh, met methodologically. And they are often poorly adapted to the relevant culture and context. There are few reliable figures, results of studies vary widely, and accordingly can only give an indication of trends. So, High levels of distress, in some cases accompanied by symptoms of anxiety and depression, were declared by 42% uh, of a sample of Syrian refugees in Turkey and Lebanon that we recently interviewed. Um, we found symptoms at uh, PTSD in a third of a group of Syrian refugees in Turkey, with higher figures for women and for people who had suffered multiple uh, traumatic events. Um, a recent study conducted by the International Medical Corps revealed that a third of those surveyed had persistently high anxiety scores. And they found particularly high prevalence rates of 45% for PTSD uh, among Syrian refugee children in Turkey. So that gives you an idea of the impact of, uh, of, uh, of the crisis and the, and the major needs in terms of, uh, of, of support for those, uh, for those uh, target populations. So that, that's it on my side, uh, unless you want me to, to develop more about like the, the social stigma or the, the other health services that, that need to be provided to those populations. Hey, Dr. Badezi, um, I believe your microphone's muted. Thanks, John. And no thank you very much here for that background and, and context as it provides us with, with, with an understanding or at least an increased awareness of the, the issues from the home country perspective as well as in the displaced population as well. Now, mm -hmm. I have some questions for you, for, you, for you, Pierre, and we also welcome those of us who are in this session to feel free to raise your hand type your question into the chat box and we can also allow you to, to open up your mic and, and, and interact with, with Pierre as well. Pierre, my first question to you is, what was your experience or your drive to even pro propose or project a career interest in working with refugees? Wow. Well, um... <laughs> I'll be very honest. I was not picturing myself uh, um, uh, working for a bank, making money. I just, I just wanted to find a, a meaningful uh, uh, a work. And, uh, and frankly speaking, I started working. I studied like rural development and uh, livelihoods. And, but I was not feeling like working for Danone or Nestle. I was more feeling like supporting uh, farmers in, a, in, a, in other countries. So it started that way. And, uh, and then I started intervening like in Yemen on, on uh, emergency responses uh, with uh, integrated approaches, uh, mixing uh, nutrition, 
uh, uh, recovery and uh, and uh, transition towards like uh, livelihoods. So um, I found that uh, that uh, that sector was offering really like a, a stimulating uh, environment, intellectually speaking, and uh, uh, obviously from a human perspective. So like every time um, uh, every time I, I work on a different context, it's as if I was questioning and starting over. Uh, uh, the experience you, you, you question permanently your your knowledge and you, and you you keep learning so I think it's it's, it's very fruitful and it's very stimulating uh, in terms of, of experience and after like well um, I also studied in the past anthropology so it was very interesting for me to to select uh, um, to select well countries where I would operate based also on, on uh, well my, my 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 fascination for for the history for the cultural system and for the type of crisis so um, what is interesting with that with that sector also is that you can sometimes work on on proper like uh, emergency responses as you can also work on on the on development uh, sectors or, or post emergency recovery i'll give you an example uh, when i worked in a, in a, in haiti I worked there for three years, and uh, I was supposed to to work on on the on several value chains, agricultural value chains, mango, avocado, and uh, I ended up also responding to emergencies because of uh, the numerous cyclones that, that that were striking the region. So you have to balance, and it's, it's completely different type of of uh, operations that you need to implement. And uh, I yeah, I mean, I, I found the experience like uh, it's it's hard to go back to a. A normal life after after living those experiences, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, I'm I'm certain it's it's, it's it's highly appreciated and necessary as well for you to be part of the response and the team working with these refugee communities. Also, okay. we have Deborah, so we're going to open up Deborah your 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 mic. So Deborah, you can actually share your your questions comments with us here. Hi, Deborah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, sharing your experience with the Syrian refugees. I had a question specifically about that population. I had read that um, in Jordan, initially they had started giving healthcare services for free for the population. And then last year they had to, they started to change uh, the way that they delivered healthcare for refu registered refugees with the UNHCR, where they started charging them at a foreigner-based rate. And I wanted to know, from your perspective, is that an example of a host country having their native healthcare system being overwhelmed by having to take care of refugee populations? Or was it a, is it an example of a country making a conscious decision to try and limit the amount of resources that are being divvied up amongst refugees? Hmm. Uh, that's an excellent question. Actually, the, the, the context uh, in the region varies from, from one country to another. Uh, I will first uh, uh, talk to you about, about Lebanon, and then I will respond to your question uh, in, a, in, in the context of Jordan. So in Lebanon, for instance, um, the, the UNHCR um, are providing free health care to the, to the refugees. Basically, they have a, a refugee card, and they can access uh, um, uh, specific uh, health facilities across the country. Then for um, more serious pathologies, then sometimes this can give rise to, uh, to additional costs and um, there are mechanisms uh, among NGOs or, or uh, UN agencies to, so as to support this cost. Um, the problem is like in Lebanon or in, in Jordan, the government uh, kept playing with um, with the presence of refugees, so as to to gain more uh, funding from uh, from uh, from Western countries and uh, from the countries among the Security Council, the UN Security Council, because uh, the strategy that was used by Western countries was, for me, a strategy of containment. They wanted to contain the crisis around the borders of Syria, and so uh, what were the first countries hosting the refugees? Well, you had Jordan, Lebanon. If you, if you talk about Lebanon, you have a country before the crisis of approximately 5 million uh, uh, Lebanese inhabitants. And uh, with the crisis, there were uh, 1.2 million uh, Syrian refugees who entered the country. 
And I'm not even counting here the 750,000 Palestinian refugees who have been there since, uh, since ages. So the challenge is that the, the health, uh, health system in, in Lebanon doesn't have obviously the capacity to absorb uh, all the, the that additional patients and, uh, and uh, they are like uh, uh, major weaknesses in terms of, for instance, mental health. Um, when an NGO, for instance, implements activities in the field, um, we had some um, case management uh, teams who would work especially on, on protection cases of uh, sexual gender-based violence, of uh, uh, other, other kind of, uh, of thematics. And the challenge was to find uh, the relevant entities able to, to, uh, to take care of the referral. An NGO, for instance, which would not have like a, a, an expertise in, this, uh, in sexual gender-based violence or in the mental health, uh, psychological support, would refer it to a, a Lebanese institution uh, attached to the government. But most of the time, once, uh, once we were conducting these referrals, like the, the, the entity afterwards was not really following up on the case. So that's why uh, uh, major uh, medical NGOs like Doctor Without Borders started intervening in, the, in, in Lebanon or in Jordan on, on mental health. Which, which you would consider is not really the mandate usually, like if you think about the interventions in, in the South Sudan or Afghanistan or, or Congo recently, but they had to, to shift and adapt their, their modus operandi in the Middle East based on the, on, on the crisis and, and based on the gaps of the, the health systems in those countries. Um, to respond to your query about, about Jordan, I think, um, it's also a problem of, of funding uh, because we face similar cases in back in 2015, 16, when the, the, donor, the donor community didn't uh, meet like the, 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 the requirements in terms of uh, funding appeal. Uh, so there was a shortage of funding. There was a shortage of funding and, um, and they were, um, they had to reduce, the World Food Programme had to reduce the, the food rations provided to the Syrian uh, refugee families. So the case you are mentioning now, for me, it's a bit the same. The international community now entering the eight years of the crisis is reluctant to keep uh, uh, funding like the, 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 the emergency, the humanitarian response, I should say. And so it's, not, it's less supportive with the, with the countries who are hosting like the, the refugees. And yeah, frankly speaking, I don't think like the the current condition of the healthcare system in Jordan has the capacity to, to fully absorb uh, uh, new patients or at least like the, 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 the number of refugees present in Jordan. Thank you for that question, Deborah, as well. Thank we have, you. We have some, some, some notes as well from, from, from the chat box. And, and here we just reach out to you for you to respond. From what I hear, and this is from Nara, what I hear from, your, from some of your refugees is that they have allocated specific clinics and hospitals that can access with their cards. Do you think that the country's way of trying to adapt by allocating specific resources to refugees, maybe only the clinics supporting financially by NGOs, or are we really capable of accessing all healthcare facilities? Well, there is also the challenge of, of cost for, for some of these populations. When I was referring to the access to specific health facilities, I meant that um, obviously public health facilities were, um, were, let's phrase it that way, that Syrian refugees were provided with a list of health facilities that they could refer to in case of, of, uh, of, uh, of any, any health issue. So I'm not saying that they could, uh, uh, um, they could go and, uh, and, uh, and meet any doctor at any facility. They were referred to specific public health facility with uh, enough equipment to, 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 to be able to respond to the, to the pathologies that they would, uh, they would, um, they would tackle. So that's, that's more the case. But um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to balance between the actual capacity of the state and because Sometimes we, we, we noticed in, the, in, in Jordan or Lebanon a lack of investment from the, the government into the health sector and governments kind of, kind of instrumentalizing the, uh, the, the, 
the humanitarian crisis to get funding so as to kind of enhance, uh, uh, if you want, the, the, the infrastructure. So they are trying to, to, to deviate like the, the, the initial aim of, 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 um, of, uh, of the, the funding, humanitarian funding, towards like the reinforcement of their infrastructure, which will not only be serving like the, the, the refugees, but also like the, 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 the host communities. So, uh, um, so yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a tricky situation, yeah. Pierre, what I would also like us to, to maybe what, build a greater understanding of is the demog demographics in terms of the age, the gender of this refugee population in a particular camp. For example, last week, we spoke with a South Sudanese refugee. And from that perspective, when we examined the, the experience, a lot of the males were, were, were retained in, in the civil war. Females and children, elderly were the ones who flee. The elderly tend to succumb to the traumatic travel experience. So you sort of have females and children predominate the, the refugee camps. Has that been the, the, the case in your experiences? And from that perspective, if that's the demographic representation, what are the, the, the particular mental health and social issues for, for, for children growing up? Because this, is a, this will be a lifelong experience for them. Um, well, you have like the, the, the factor, the, the stigma of uh, social exclusion, because uh, after, um, after leaving their country, they have to recreate uh, um, uh, a new bulk of, uh, of, uh, of social ties and they can't rely upon the social ties to to uh, to cope with their with their daily needs. So we observed like a, a negative coping mechanism, like a, a, a early marriage, like a prostitution uh, um, that that refugees were were resorting to, so as to to cope with their with their limited uh, limited livelihoods and limited financial means. So um, in terms of of age group. Yeah, it's true that uh, uh, the, the youth, the 15, 24, tend to, to be willing already to, 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 to travel outside. But like there are many restrictions uh, related, for instance, to, their, to the non-renewal of their, of their refugee card, uh, to the delay in, in, the, in providing them with an updated status. Uh, they face like uh, basic issues like crossing checkpoints, and the hands like the, the, the limitations in terms of, of movements, uh, either to, to access like the, the, the health facilities, uh, to access work when, the, when they work as daily workers in the agricultural lands, or even, uh, um, yeah, even to, to buy like uh, basic staple products. So, yeah. But like, the, it's true that like the, the um, we, had, we had a program in Lebanon quite interesting where we were uh, supporting, uh, uh, we were engaging men in reducing like uh, 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 gender-based violence, domestic violence. And uh, we were using like uh, different sessions um, to, um, it, it was made of, it was a program with 12 sessions where we were challenging the, the masculine norms using sometime uh, verses of the Quran so as to, to explain to them and their uh, different perspective, like the, the challenges that they were facing and uh, Helping, providing them with the tools to to understand the to to mitigate all those frustration that they were feeling, and which was actually impacting afterwards their 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 household. Um, like yeah, the, the the first I mean the first consequence sadly of uh, of the conflict on on the on the, on the households were like the the increased resort to violence by by the head of household uh, over the the wives the children, and hence creating tensions at home. You had also the, the fact that many Syrian men uh, were feeling useless, uh, powerless, because normally there was a traditional like a breadwinner of the household. And in the context of their, their displacement, suddenly they had to, to go with a, um, and queue with their refugee card in, uh, in front of uh, the World Food Program Office or the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And, um, and for sure it creates frustrations and there is a, a feeling of, of not being useful anymore to the household, nor to the community. Uh, many of those uh, uh, Syrian refugees were very educated, were lawyers, were, were, were doctors. Hence, like the fact of 
going back to a life where they can't actually do anything because the government, for instance, in Lebanon was uh, putting a lot of restrictions for them to work. And they had only like a granted two or three specific sectors in which the, the Syrian refugees were allowed to work, which were construction mostly and, and uh, agriculture. So as if you know, it, these were like uh, uh, jobs like that the Lebanese community did not want to, to, to implement themselves. So yeah. Exactly. So Pierre, what I'm interested in in, in, in trying to, to, to imagine at the, at the perspective of a refugee camp, when you have this mass number of persons that are densely populated together in this location, what efforts are made for community organization? Because it would suggest that if you are to maintain civility, mitigate the issues of crime violence, there is a need for, for a social structure, a community organization, where leaders within the refugee community assist the coordinating agencies like who you work with to, to manage this population dynamic. Mm, okay, so what can be done and uh, um, is like to combine like integrated interventions, mixing uh, uh, education, protection, uh, livelihood assistance, or even uh, water and sanitation in the context of, of uh, camps or in the, in, the, in the context of Lebanon with the informal settlements. Um, we were, for instance, uh, installing water tanks, were uh, building septic tanks, and, and um, the populations were creating like camp committees would be in charge of, of, uh, of dealing afterwards with the, with the water trucking contractors, or when we were uh, connecting those informal settlements or camps to existing water systems, municipality water systems, uh, they were representatives among the refugees would meet on a regular basis, on a monthly basis with the, with the municipalities so as to, to tackle any, any issues that, that might arise. So we were try, striving for, for empowering the refugees, uh, for them to go back to a, a sort of, of, uh, of a normal life uh, in terms of provision of basic services. So I'm, I was referring now to the provision yeah, of, of, of wash or sanitation services. I was mentioning earlier also like the, um, the referral system between all the UN agencies and INGOs and local NGOs uh, in terms of so for the refugees to be able to, to go to any health facilities, to refer their kids to uh, uh, schools, schools in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood. So you try to provide like yeah, um, um, all the, the, the major services so as for the, for the parents to feel that they, they can actually help the children uh, resuming their life in a, in a kind of normal way. And um, to reduce yeah, the, the, the risk of, of kids dropping out and to favor like school retention, uh, we were trying to uh, um, encourage the employment of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Syrian refugees working the, in, a, in the agricultural lands also organizing a technical vocational training with, uh, with some refugees so as to, yeah, to, to, to favor the job placement on, on, on the markets. The challenge both in, in Lebanon or Jordan, for instance, is that the, the market is, is quite saturated <clears throat> and the government there have not identified proper like niche markets in, uh, which could absorb like the, 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 the Syrian workforce. Hence, hence the challenge and sometimes like the the, the tensions between the host communities and, and the refugees. But uh, I just wanted to, to highlight one thing uh, regarding the social stigma, because <clears throat> there is also the ingrained social stigma of seeking counseling. It's, it's, a, it's a major barrier raised by uh, adults in the, in the recent researches that we did in, in Syria or in, uh, in, uh, in Jordan. Talking openly about psychosocial problems and care is taboo and leads to embarrassment and fear among, uh, among children suffering with, uh, with those issues. So most of the professionals uh, um, we spoke to said that this negative perception has gradually improved as the war has gone, uh, has gone on and uh, its uh, psychological impact has grown. And there is now more acceptance of younger children seeking help, particularly like psychosocial activities through arts and drama. So, um, so yeah. 
So social stigma and ingrained uh, attitudes to mental health remain for me, in my, in my opinion, a significant challenge. Even now, clinics in some areas um, told us recently that they, they do not advertise their work on mental health issues publicly, instead relying on referrals and, and word of mouth. So older boys and young men are particularly hard to reach and are put under pressure to try and cope on their own rather than, than seek support. So boys face like particular pressure to, to man up, as we say, you know, which leads, which leads boys to, we need help to become more aggressive and assert their masculine identity. So boys who wet the bed are sometimes made fun of at home. They are told they are behaving like girls and they won't become a man. The, this also adds new stress on top of the stress, which made them wet the bed in the first place. Uh, this was uh, the, the testimony of a psychologist that uh, we were talking to lately in, in southern Syria. So the main the recommendation for humanitarian agencies is, is to expand <clears throat> mental health and psychosocial support and education programs for children in Syria and uh, ensure that all the psychosocial elements are integrated across uh, the other sectors. Um, the second point is to raise awareness with communities and parents on mental health and psychosocial issues for children and work to reduce the stigma around uh, these issues by highlighting that the symptoms being expressed by children in these situations are a normal response given the persistent violence to which they have been exposed. Thank you, Pierre. We have a question from, from Lisa Radix who, who's thanking you for your informative talk. And her question is, what is being done to expect the immigration processing and acceptance of refugees into first world countries? So hopefully that will reduce the time as well that it's spent in the actual refugee camps as well. I would be, I would be very sharp on that. Nothing, nothing has been done. Okay. Um, being French citizen, I'm, I'm ashamed of my country in their, in their response to what the, the Syria crisis. Um, the thing is, the, the governments in, in Europe, like Germany, France, uh, Germany has hosted more and more refugees but in terms of facilitating like the, 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 the migration of, of, of these refugees who are, who are uh, putting their life at, the, at stake in, in, in Syria, um, not much has been done because France, for instance, uh, was not uh, complying with the, with the Geneva Conventions. They were like dealing case by case with situations, although like uh, most of the applications were were, 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 were submitted by, by, by refugees directly. Um, so if they had fled, uh, if they had fled Syria, the, the point is nowadays there is no opportunity to return. Um, I will give you an example. Recently, I was uh, monitoring the program funded by the, um, the, the UK government. They were sponsoring an, uh, an, uh, an English NGO working in six locations of Syria. <clears throat> and they wanted to uh, support the governance structures in the, in the opposition elder areas. And they wanted to focus a lot on, on, the, on the health infrastructure. It turned out that their lack of geopolitical analysis uh, had an impact because they had not anticipated that the regime of Damascus and the Russians would take back those areas. So they had to stop that, that five year program uh, after like only 20 months because they were not able to, to, to support any more like the, the, the local councils or provincial councils. Um, so a lot of the, the Syrian refugees uh, feel abandoned and uh, many of them like prefer to stay in one of the neighboring countries because well, they speak, they speak, uh, um, they speak Arabic. So at least they can still integrate partially in the, some of these communities <laughs> and the traveling to, to Europe uh, from word to mouth, many refugees know that like uh, uh, most of the uh, European countries have closed their borders or are filtering and it becomes very difficult to, to, to move, for instance, to Sweden or, or Norway or countries who had like a, a, a traditional legacy in terms of uh, hosting, uh, hosting refugees. So I think like all governments in, in Europe um, should really like support in a better way like the, the the response to the to the crisis in the neighboring countries where most of the refugees are living and they should also like provide like a 
comply with the Geneva Conventions when it comes to, to hosting people whose life was, uh, was in danger? I don't know if it answers fully to the question, but yeah. Definitely, you know, we, we, we had the conversation <laughs> in the course and we appreciate the perspective that people will not leave their, their country or their homes unless they are, I mean, there are significant push factors for them. Um, because the experience for a refugee is not a healthy, it's not a safe one. So people will, will make a decision to risk their lives because when you balance the, the risk analysis, staying at home is, 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 is more at risk than, than becoming a refugee. So, so I think the, the, the course really understands that as well. We have a question from Fahad, who is asking about the images that are painted towards refugees, especially in first world countries. What are some of the, 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 the push factors for persons in, in first world countries that are concerned, that have negative adverse perspectives about refugees entering into their countries? Well, I think that what rules in Europe is, a, is a ignorance. Because I would give you an example. I worked when I was in Spain for the Red Cross um, I was working with asylum seekers, and there is that, that cliche stereotype of thinking that um, like that uh, most of the of the, the people want to come to Europe, and uh, this is the first like El Dorado that that people, for instance, from Africa are looking for, which is completely wrong. Nine Africans out of ten who are migrating are migrating to uh, inside Africa to three key countries: Angola, South Africa, and and Congo. So the reality is, 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 is another than the one sold also by the mass media. And I think that the, the mass media, which are like <laughs> controlled by, by, uh, by oligarch, um, also want to disclose and, and to play the, the figure of the, of the refugee, like threatening the, 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 the jobs of the, of the Europeans. So, so it's, it's a cliche that, that, that we face, but um, in terms of assistance, yeah, there's a lack of analysis about the situation and trying to differentiate between um, economic migration and humanitarian migration due to a, a sporadic crisis arising in a specific context like in Afghanistan or, or, or in, in Congo or, you know, in South Sudan. So I think like, uh, uh, sadly, the, the Western countries are still uh, using the prism of their uh, colonial past to, uh, to kind of select the migration channels and the nationalities that they will accept in, the, in, the, in their countries. Like France, after the Second World War, um, uh, recruited a lot or, or, or um, accepted, hosted a lot of uh, Malian, Senegalese, Moroccan people, so as to rebuild the country. But then afterwards, uh, um, those people, uh, because of family gathering, uh, well, uh, hosted their family, and now they're well settled in France. And the people that seem to have a very short memory. So I think it's part of society to to build a, a, a cosmo cosmopolitan like a, a network, and and uh, yeah, and to make the most of the presence of people from different cultures. So I think you know, in a country is like you don't have enough um, uh, mediatic space for sociologists, anthropologists, or researchers to explain, um, to explain the situation about like uh, uh, these differences between the economic migration or related to, uh, to uh, humanitarian uh, crisis. And most in Europe, most of the, the, I wouldn't call them refugees, but call them migrants are coming from Eastern Europe, you know? So again, the figures about like the thinking that uh, 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 Syrians or, or Africans are invading Europe is a, is a, is a lie, is a complete lie. Well, what I would also like to add as well, Pierre, and I totally agree with you, is for some of these countries, when we think about their demographic transition, their fertility rate suggests that they will have difficulty in replacing the population in 25 years. So for countries who are having difficulty with, with maintaining a population, they seem to have more friendly policies as it relates to migrants and refugees because they are seeking persons to enter their country, to join the workforce, to pay taxes, for example, as part of that, that country's economic 
maintenance and, and well-being. So, so definitely the argument is an economic one as well in terms of whether or not countries seem to decide the path and, and the acceptance of refugees into their particular countries and jurisdictions. No, I agree, I agree. Um, I mean, everything would have been much more simple if uh, like the, the international uh, community had, had tackled the issue of the, of the Syria crisis since, since in the beginning. There were like many uh, tergiversations, uh, uh, hesitations by, by United States, France and UK uh, after like they were the first cases of chemical weapons being used in Syria. And like, well, obviously they faced also the obstructions of the UN Security Council by, by, by China and Russia. But um, I think in terms of economic integration and related, yeah, to the, related to demographic factors, obviously in the, in the, within 30 years, uh, um, there would be a gap, there would be a need for, for an increase of the population even to be able to maintain like the, the retirement pension scheme in, the, <laughs> in Europe. So, so I would tend to think that uh, like uh, any, uh, any arrival of, of, uh, of uh, workforce or new citizens would be, uh, would be, uh, would be welcome. Great. So Pierre, we have another question and the course is actually very much populated by persons with an interest in, in healthcare. We have persons in, in medical field and pers persons who are, who are pursuing medical education as well. And one question that came up from, from Lisa is what would you consider the single most important piece of advice to give to someone who is currently working in a refugee camp or a detention center, an immigration detention center, from a medical capacity? What, what advice would you give to someone from a medical perspective? From a medical perspective, hmm. um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, no, I, I would tend to think like any staff I, I, I working in, a, in such environment should be well acquainted with the, with the context or read about like uh, the place of origins where the uh, refugee come from, so as to be able to empathize and, and to and to develop a social bond with those refugees and not to reduce them only as, as a patient, but to be able to, to facilitate the communication for them to, to, op to, open, to open themselves. And, uh, and yeah, that, that would be my first, uh, my first recommendation, yeah. yeah. So, so in our discussions and our course thus far, one of the items we discussed was the determinants of a refugee. So we spoke about persecution, we spoke about civil war, we spoke about, about environmental changes like famine and drought, for example. And what is emerging as a theme, regardless of wherever we analyze refugee crises, is that there seem to be an underlying environmental issue, whether it's climate change effects, whether it's, it's water security issues. From your experiences and the population groups that you work with, and in particular, understanding their source country. Do you see a pattern or a trend as it relates to environmental changes, as it relates to food security, water security, and that serving as, as a primary determinant for refugees? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I was last week uh, uh, in Mali, actually, and um, you may have heard about the, the crisis in the Mopti region in the north, in Gawa, Timbuktu. So, it's mostly related actually to climate change. Although so some of the, the, the international specialists want, uh, are not are getting a blind eye to that crisis, but basically you have uh, uh, different types of, of population there, uh, herders, farmers, and, the, and, um, and the situation is that because of the climate change, you had like repeated drops obviously in the 70s, 80s, but recently the, the drought patterns have, uh, have um, have increased, and so it altered the access to uh, to oases or water points for um, the Fulani herders, for instance, who were using like a, a huge uh, transhumance path, for instance, in the in the in the center of Mali in a, in the Mopti region. And nowadays, <clears throat> they have to to get closer to the to the farmer villages so as to be able to to uh, um, to well to provide grazing to their to their to their to their uh, cattle 
and this creates tensions because before you had a kind of uh, uh, informal informal like uh, uh, agreement and timing based on the agricultural season meaning that after the, the first harvest when the the, the remaining stems were uh, left in the fields the farmers would open their their, their lands for the for the herders to to um, to send their their the cattle to to graze and now because of the the tension related to the water resources or or to the the impact on the on the crops due to the droughts um, this created tensions between those groups and the the, the transhuman paths have been altered also so you have all these agro pastoral dynamics which have completely evolved and uh, and which create tensions with populations who are abandoning even like their their way of life their their nomadic way of life and are now like uh, um, becoming more and more sedentary and and uh, and uh, they have because they have to develop new coping mechanism to be able to meet their like their 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 food security needs and then be one of their households so i mean i just gave the example of of mali but it's something that you could find also in the entire uh, sahel region with the lake chat crisis People like to talk about uh, um, um, Boko Haram, for instance, in, in Nigeria, Niger, uh, Niger region. But the same, the same factors are happening. You have these issues of demographic pressure, of transhumanist pathways, which have which have changed, and uh, and the regular droughts. So uh, it's it's affecting like the, the the crops. It's affecting like the the the, the agricultural calendar. And it's creating tensions between the between the uh, nomadic and sedentary communities. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. We have Deborah. Deborah, you can. Yes. Um, I since you guys were talking about climate change and everything with the population, it brought to mind the Rohingya population in Cox Bazar, and how they had to deal with the monsoon season, and they also had a population where they simply didn't have enough midwives to handle the um, obstetric and maternal health needs of the population. So they started training community healthcare workers in order to make sure that the refugees were able to treat their own population and they spoke their own language since that was a problem in that region as well. So I was going to have the same needs. Is that something that people are trying to do uh, with the Syrian population in order to help alleviate the burden on host population healthcare systems? Yeah, it's it's, it's something quite quite common within um, uh, within uh, um, med medical NGOs to resort to uh, community health workers. Actually, they yes, they take care of the awareness campaigns uh, uh, related, for instance, to to polio, measles, or but like uh, I would like to highlight here that the the critical shortage of professional care like in Syria, um, child psychologists and mental health experts are were very rare in Syria even before. Um, the war has exacerbated this gap, with many professionals having been killed or or fled the country. So hospitals and health centers are are um, routinely targeted and caught in the crossfires, with a. Uh, for instance, in 2016, they were like, in the, in the first nine months of 2016, there were 101 attacks against health facilities recorded. Um, before the war, there were only like two public psychiatric hospitals in all of Syria for a population of more than uh, 21 million. So uh, they, are, they are estimated to be only around 70 psychiatrists working in the entire country, most of them in Damascus. So. The vast areas, for instance, of eastern Ghouta and Dara, where around like 1.4 million people live, uh, are served by just two professional psychiatrists. So fighting and checkpoints also leave uh, experts unable to, to, to access many areas. Uh, those mental health professionals remain like women working are themselves often overwhelmed, burnt out, and, um, and in need of more support. Many having themselves uh, experienced traumatic events or been displaced. Um, in a recent assessment uh, by WHO into the capacity of mental health and of psychosocial practitioners in Syria, the majority lacked uh, um, field training and the skills for diagnosing and managing mental health disorders related to the current war context, such as sexual abuse, 
suicide or self harm uh, and amputations. Um, graduates with a bachelor degree in social work and psychology end up uh, uh, taking on much of the role and they need a great deal of training, which usually has to be conducted by experts outside the area over the phone or via Skype due to the dangers and, uh, and restrictions on movement. So um, the shortage of trained experts um, and clinics means professional mental health uh, um, and psychosocial support is rarely available to, to, to children, for instance, who need it. Only 20% of functioning health facilities provide basic mental health services. Um, so humanitarian programs in Sierra are, are often founded in, in very short cycles, you know, sometimes for just six months at a time. This can have particularly critical consequences for, uh, for mental health and psychosocial support. And it sometimes leads to programs ending just as children are opening up about the distress and are at the, at the most vulnerable. Um, I remember one ed worker saying uh, that they had to stop their activities in the middle due to lack of phones. It destroys everything and you lose all the positive work you have done with the children. It can take a lot of time to help these kids. Some need a year of gradual support and then the program has to end after six months and donors don't seem to understand the impact this has on the children. So, yeah. And Pierre, what is interesting about that is, well, for developed countries, mental health is, 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 is gradually becoming accepted as, as a health issue. And of course, the legislation is being developed. And with that, we have mental health services provided for it. But in developing country context, mental health is not even considered sometimes a, a, a health issue. So for, for these refugee groups, they would not have even grown up with, with, with considerations and that mental health is an issue for them. So from that perspective, how can we even sensitize and, and build awareness for these refugee communities that mental health is real and you need to be aware of it as well as be managed for it as well? Mm. Well, you... The example I provided earlier about that engaging men program, um, it's, it's, it's funny because to, to design that, pro that program and, and, uh, and tackle the issue of gender-based violence and, and uh, um, committed by men and their domestic households, um, we inspired from a manual uh, drafted by uh, uh, Promundo, a Brazilian NGO, who was working exclusively on, on, on domestic violence. So we adapted it, we tailored it to the, to the Syrian context. And uh, like I was mentioning earlier, we were using some, uh, some verses of the Quran so as to, to, to build an understanding uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from our audiences. But it takes like different sessions about uh, uh, self-respect, about like a, a comparative analysis between what those people, their attitudes in their, within their household before the war, after the war, um, to kind of develop a self-awareness about what has changed in their, uh, in, in their behavior, uh, what are the barriers for them to, to, to return to, to that like uh, uh, former, uh, former individual that they were, you know? So you have, you have different mechanism and, uh, and uh, psychosocial support like tools to, um, to, to, to reach uh, or to try to, to, for them to, to, to question their attitudes and uh, tackle those issues, yeah. You know, Pierre, thus far we have been discussing the, the health issues and, and burdens of refugees. Can you share with us from the perspective of, of, a, of a worker who is, who is managing refugees, what are the health issues of, of workers who are managing refugees because they are observing firsthand the, the, the significant challenges of, of humanity as, as it relates to, to, to the crisis of refugees? Can you, can you speak to that, especially from the perspective of our course community being healthcare providers? And what are some of the, the health issues for, for healthcare workers themselves? Sorry, uh, we were cut with the connection. Could you repeat like uh, shortly sure. the question? Sorry. Well, sorry about that. So my, my question is, we have been discussing the health burdens and, and issues of refugee groups. But at the same time, we should also bear in mind persons who are working with these groups are having health issues also. Can you, can you comment on, on, on the health issues or challenges for health workers like yourselves? Because what you are observing firsthand are a lot of, 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 of the, the adverse consequences of, of, of humanity 
and also the implications that it has on your own health? Um, there were major issues related to, um, to reproductive health. As I, as I was highlighting earlier with, uh, with changes in terms of uh, um, like reports of, donor, of doctors postponing elective surgeries, I mentioned that earlier, the request of uh, premature discharge from care, the request for C-section instead of a vaginal delivery. So, um, so these, these were like the, 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 the major cases and that, uh, that uh, were observed in the, in the informal settlements, for instance, in, in, in Lebanon, yeah. And in terms of family planning, obviously, I haven't mentioned that, but family planning and childbearing is also uh, uh, some, something that, uh, that has evolved, that, you do, uh, that has impacted significantly, the, uh, that has been impacted by the conflict, yeah. Okay, I'm just thinking, if I'm just looking, I'm not seeing any, any other questions in the chat box or even hands raised. So in, I'm not sure if there are any other questions from, from, our, from, our, from our course audience today, but are, are there any, let's say, final conclusions? What, what, what do you project or predict to be the, the trends going forward as it relates to, the, to the, the quantity of refugees but also the developing and emerging crises or, or, of, of, or potentially whatever, it, whatever trends that you predict? Huh. Um, the challenge is that in the region, um, we run the risk of having the same cases than, than, than the Palestinians. Because now in specific regions of, uh, of uh, the Northwest of, of Syria, uh, many, many people were left to uh, Idlib or, or Aleppo or Hama. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen their land expropriated. So there is no perspective for them to return as long as the, the, the Ba'ath regime of, uh, of Al-Assad uh, remains in power. So uh, we have the perspective of a long-term uh, displacement. And, and uh, you were mentioning earlier, like the, the demographic factor is that in Lebanon, there are many, many Syrian, uh, uh, well, kids who are, uh, who are who will just like uh, grow up in, uh, in in exile, and the situation will be: Do we think that the the, the host countries uh, like Lebanon or Jordan or Iraq are going to provide them with the nationality, or or uh, will they have to wait to return to Syria to to get it? And this is a bit of the of, of the challenge. I think it's a uh, it's a potential, like foudrier, uh, uh, as we would say in French. Yeah, it's a, it could be a huge, huge issue in the in the in the coming years. So uh, unless unless there is a political uh, uh, solution which is uh, identified, which would be identified so as to facilitate the return of some of the communities. I mean, now you can already see like uh, that um, that the Russians and and the Chinese are positioning themselves to invest. Uh, massively in the reconstruction of of uh, of uh, several cities of Syria is going to take like uh, like ages, uh, decades, like three decades to, to 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 rebuild the country, given the the, the damage is caused by the war. But like this population in exile, uh, the resentment and the, and the fact that they will live in exile, they might become a, a new Palestinian generation. You know, so um, so I would I would expect to see more and more. Uh, uh, migration towards like uh, Western countries, in the absence of of uh, or reasons or perspectives for for these refugee communities, because if they remain in in Jordan, Lebanon, and they don't they can't benefit from a proper status and or access livelihood opportunities, then the the humanitarian system will have to to keep uh, providing what food rations and uh, providing basic services, but this is not sustainable uh, in the long term. This this cannot work. So, um, so Western countries need to really understand that either they identify a, a political solution, um, um, either either like a, a, the, it, it might become like a, a, a tricky situation with a, with a larger uh, refugee communities uh, living in those uh, in those countries, but uh, with no with no perspective, no reason. Exactly. And that means more work for you, Pierre. Um, more, more challenges we face, but but, but certainly it's uh, 
it, it's a it's a multi multi complicated situation. In our in our course series at St George's University, we we are examining the issue of one health and one medicine because we believe that health is is, is linked to to the environment, linked to many many factors. And on the point of refugee and migrant health, we appreciate that refugees' health is is a geopolitical. It's a socioeconomic issue as much as a, a biological issue, a microbiological issue as well. And if we are to intervene effectively, if the problems are geopolitical and socioeconomic, then the solutions are also required to be geopolitical and socioeconomic as well at the same time. Okay. Indeed, yeah. I, I just want to, to mention something that, you know, I've worked 12 years in the, in, in the field. And now uh, in Turkey, I'm, I'm doing more some, some research work kind of doing a programming audit for you know, agencies and, the, and international NGOs. So it's, it's kind of interesting to work on the qualitative aspect of, uh, of, um, of humanitarian program implementation, you know. It's a different way to contribute to the, um, that to contribute to, uh, to, the, to an, an enhancement of the living conditions of refugees. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting to, to switch and pass on the other side of the of the of the barrier, you know. But uh, my my partner was highlighting to me that I hadn't responded to to the previous question of a student. I was asked about my own health, right, yeah. earlier. <laughs> so the question was if 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 all of that had an impact on my life, right, on my own health, like in terms of a, a psychosocial or mental health condition, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So I will try to respond very briefly to that. Um, I don't know how to explain to you. Um, in the beginning, I think the, the first uh, assignments in the, in, the, in, the, in Darfur or, or Chad or Yemen, it was quite difficult because, like, uh, um, I was really living in the bush, responding to the emergencies, working uh, almost seven days per week, and. Um, and so you, you, human beings, I think, work like a sponge, you know? You tend to absorb until reaching a point where, like, you burn out and, they, and it becomes difficult to, to keep working in that environment. So the solution, if I, if I can call that a solution, is not to, to want to distance oneself uh, from situation, but it's just, like, to, to be humble with, uh, with one's capacity and, and uh, uh, keep in mind that nothing will be solved in one day, you know? So, um, so one needs to, to, to preserve himself or self and, uh, and be capable to, to put, back, uh, put things into perspective. What matters is like uh, uh, delivering, implementing quality, quality programs, uh, uh, helping refugees, increasing like participatory approaches to make sure that the, 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 the programs are, are uh, actually serving the beneficiaries and and uh, and making sure that the refugees or beneficiaries are empowered through those programs, because the problem of the sector is that sometimes, including in the health sector, is that many programs are designed from a, a, an office in the, in, the, in Brussels, and you need so, solid and thorough needs assessment, uh, evaluation of the of the needs and the baseline studies, so as to be able to inform the decision the, the decisions and the the strategic decisions that will uh, contribute to the design of your programs. So I think the sectors would uh, would learn to to spend more time in in uh, collecting data, quantitative data uh, at house or level, or qualitative data. You know, through different methodologies like key informant interviews with uh, with various practitioners in the health sector, um, uh, key informant interviews with local councils, uh, with uh, or or even like focus group discussions with people belonging from the same age group so as to retrieve trends and be able to, to design uh, activities which are in line with the main concerns and, and priorities of, uh, of the populations that we serve. So I, I think like sometimes people tend to use emergency responses as an excuse uh, to explain like the, the weaknesses of their programs. But when actually like, uh, uh, if better information or better data had been collected, uh, been collected ahead of the of the intervention, then then the impact would be would be uh, would be uh, better and on on the on the living condition of those communities. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, the, the the sector really needs to 
to do better, to, to collect more data and to prioritize the quality in, uh, in terms of intervention uh, at, at, the, at the level of the health sector, but also in terms of water sanitation, uh, protection, education, shelter, or livelihoods. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a question coming in from Monica as well. And, and Pierre, I know that you, you are inspiring a lot of our, of, of our course colleagues here. And Monica's asking, is there any rule for a healthcare worker who is unable to, to actually go to these areas like, like yourself, but, but can they can provide help with the refugee health issue even from a distance? Well, I was providing the example of, of, uh, of, of doctors, you know, assisting uh, on Skype or, but I mean, this is, this is not the norm. So uh, um, the challenge in, in Syria is really like the, the humanitarian access uh, humanitarian corridors have been violated repeatedly by the different uh, uh, stakeholders to the conflict. But, um, I mean, many agencies are resorting to cross borders. I was explaining to you earlier the system of the, of the World Health Organization um, dealing with people from Turkey, uh, I mean, or dealing with the, 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 the people residing in northwest Syria, northeast Syria, southern Syria, from Turkey, Iraq, and Jordan. So they are um, developing cross-border interventions so as to make sure that they can reach like the uh, well to, so that, so that to make sure they can meet the needs of the beneficiaries but definitely you still have some NGOs uh, sending some staff uh, to the field I mean uh, um, <laughs> myself I was really hesitating before like uh, starting that work as a managing director for a research center but uh, yeah after 12 years in the in the field Sometimes it's good to to uh, to step back and think and uh, think with a, another look, a different look, and maybe in the future I will uh, I will go back to the field as to, so as to support directly the people. But I will be like a, I think a better ed worker with, a, with all the information I'm, I'm collecting now uh, through through my organization and uh, and yeah. So I mean like uh, Doctor Without Borders or Médecins du Monde, uh, Action Against Hunger. All of them are, are sending regularly some uh, some uh, some workers to the field. So um, I know that all you students might uh, uh, choose a, a specialty soon. But uh, um, I've collaborated um, on repeated occasions with the International Committee of the Red Cross, or so Doctor Without Borders, and a lot of, uh, of of doctors were just working for short assignment during the summer or from doing it for two to three months. Um, so it has to provide their, their expertise in the field, you know? So it's, it's not like, not all the workers have to stay like <laughs> two or three years in the same context. You can just provide like a sporadic assistance to it, which can be useful in the sector, you know? So uh, in the health sector, especially. Well, well, if there's one thing we know for sure from your, from your seminar with us is that there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of people are needed as well to, 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 to meet the, 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 the changing and challenging needs of our, of our refugee communities around the world as well. Well, Pierre, thank you very much for joining with us today and contributing to our course and the discussion as we explore the issue of refugee and migrant health. I want to thank everyone for, for, for joining the session with us as well. And in terms of the, the, the course itself, our next seminar in week three will be from the perspective of assimilating refugees as they migrate into, into, into new countries. So we will have a, 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 essentially a, a social worker in the United States who coordinates the integration of refugees into that society as well, as we continue to build on this topic of refugee and migrant health. So Pierre, thank you once again. And on behalf of all- Thank you very much, uh, Satesh. Definitely, and, and I, I hope I hope I met uh, met your expectations, and I try I strive for responding like accurately to all the queries. And uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. And it was really my pleasure to to participate here. And thank you, Pierre. And, and we really appreciate the fact that you can bring to us the, the experiences live and direct from from the from the refugee camps as well. Because what we try to do, while it's an academic course, of course, we are we are partnering with persons like yourself to ensure that our, our, our course community appreciates the reality of, of, of refugee and, and migrant health across the different phases of, of, a, of a life cycle, whether it's a refugee, whether it's the refugee camp, as well as how these refugees migrate to other countries as well. And, and, and that, that hopefully will, 
will, will, will provide the, not, not only the, the context, but also the realistic impression of what's going on in the world today as well. Mm. Thank you very much. And thank you very That's much, guys. Conclusion. Thank you very much. And, and, and John, thank you for, 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 for your support as well. And on behalf of our course, and St. George's University, we look forward to you completing your tasks for week two. Remember, there is a, a discussion post that's ongoing. And join us next week for week three as we discuss the assimilation of refugees and migrants into a host country context. Thank you, and I will see you guys then. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.